Good evening. Welcome to AV Baptist Church. Turn in your songbook to At Calvary, all the way in the back of there, if you would, all the way to the back. At Calvary. It's in those, uh, you know, off-colored pages. Doesn't have a page number. All the way in the back. At Calvary. All the way in the back, at Calvary. All right, please join me on that first verse of at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring that my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden and soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurn. To my guilty soul imploring turn to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden soul found liberty at Calvary. On that fourth, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden and soul found liberty at Calvary. Father in heaven, thank you. We are enjoying the beautiful sun as it goes down this evening. We thank you for this sunshine. Thank you for this building. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, dear God, that we can think about the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray you'd bless tonight and get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, these announcements, if you would, please. Get my bulletin out here. Don't forget to pray for the Jackson boy. Is that his name, Jackson? Last name is Jackson? Is it last name Jackson? Oh, okay. I didn't hear your head rattling, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, um, let, let that boy, if you would, pray for him. Still ill. And then we have um, the other prayer requests in the bulletin. I emphasize again Ukraine. I emphasize pray for um, a week and a half from now. We'll be having our picnic here, our annual picnic, right here on the grounds. So, we're making, trying to get preparations done for that. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. I see several people have signed up. We thank you for that. And But uh, if you can bring something, we'd like you to sign up and be a big help. All righty, so pray for that day. Uh, bring a visitor this week on Sunday. Bring a visitor next week on Sunday. Um, let's see. Uh, did I forget anything? The other prayer requests are in the bulletin. As far as I can see, that's it. And... Um, Oh, pray for Brother Daniel. Uh, he he's absent without leave. A o, what do you call it? A wall. Okay, um, he's a wall tonight. Um, that always concerns me because you know his health is uh, is not the best, and then he doesn't come down. And sometimes that has meant he's at the hospital. So um, pray for him. I hope he's not at the hospital, and so pray for him. All righty. Let's see here. Uh, memory verse for the week is James four seven. James four seven, and. James 4, 7. Let's read that together three times. If you don't have your Bible open, look on that green, bright green paper, lime green paper, or in your bulletin there. And let's read that together. Ready? James 4, 7. So admit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. All right, that'll do you good and help you too. Amen. And oh, pray for camp too. That's coming up. Um, I'm going to ask you to pray about what you can do to help the camp. And we be blessing. And we'll get our thermometer up there soon. So if you would uh, pray about that, we'd appreciate it. We'd like to have some young people there. We've got some prospects lined up, so you pray that uh, that that'll go well. And then we have also uh, pray for James Stout. I don't know if you fellows remember him. James Stout. You remember James Stout? You don't remember? Okay. Uh, they're looking at me blank stares. That means they don't remember. All right. Well, that's normal for them, though, isn't it? All right. Okay. But. Uh, uh, James Stout used to come to this church. He had twin sisters, and um, and uh, I think he's the one that had twin sisters, didn't he? Still looking at me with blank stares. Wasn't there a fellow that came to our church that had twin sisters that lived in a trailer park? Does anybody remember them? Besides me, his name is James. Oh. James Stout. I'm sorry, I confused you. JJ. Okay, does that help you? All right. His name is James or Jamie. Jamie, he goes by Jamie now, I guess. Jamie Stout. Um, and he's, uh, he, uh, pray for him. I got a phone call from him from North Carolina. I met today and uh, wanted to say howdy. And uh, so he needs our prayers. If you'd pray for him, we'd appreciate it. Um, let's see here. I think that's it. For prayer requests, I think I'm done remembering. <laughs> All righty. Let's see here. We have, uh, don't forget, the um, Saturday soul winning at 10 a.m. And start your week off right with Sunday services. And we'll be teaching on Bible mountains again this Sunday morning in Sunday school. So please be here for that. And uh, we appreciate it. Did I miss anything? It seems like I'm missing something here. I don't think so. All righty. Oh, got it all. Glad you're here tonight. <laughs> um, that's the announcements, and it's good seeing you. Good that you're where God wants you to be tonight. And let's sing another song, number 56. Number 56. <coughs> Excuse me. Number 56. When we all get to heaven. When we all get to have a number five six in your songbook, number five six, when we all get to heaven. Days like this are nice, pleasant temperatures, amen. Came when it came, I opened the windows because it was kind of stale in here. And boy, that made it nice in here. You smell the flowers coming in, see they're blossoming out there. Amen. Praise God for this weather. All right, let's sing. Please join me on that first verse, number five, six. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout the victory on that third now. Let us and be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life replay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will behold soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory. Amen. Good singing. Time for a love offering. If I can get uh, help up here, appreciate it. All right, we'll take a love offering for uh, someone who's in full-time service for God. And 
be our best to be a blessing to him. Brother Ezra, please pray. Amen. Why well, doing that? I don't know if you'll turn over number 220. Number 220. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus. <laughs> Here's your word of wisdom for tonight. Um, a little boy, he needed $100 really bad. He prayed and prayed and prayed, and weeks went by and nothing happened. He decided to... Uh, Instead of just praying, on top of it, he would write a letter to God. He wrote a letter to God requesting $100. The post office received this letter. They didn't know what to do with it. It was addressed to God. They decided to send it to the President of the United States. The President of the United States opened up the letter, and he read it, and he was impressed and touched and amused. He told his secretary, hey, why don't you send a $50 check from my account to this little boy? And so he did. The little boy was so happy with the $50 and he immediately sat down to write a thank you note to God. And this is how it went. Dear God, thank you very much for sending me the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you had to send it through Washington, D.C. And as is usual, those devils took half of it. All right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Word of wisdom. Don't send your money through Washington. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's sing 220 if you're not there. Wonderful grace of Jesus. All right, please join me on that first verse, so number 220. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By its pardon, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Oh, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled. By his transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. 
Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Amen. Good singing. That a grand old song. Praise God. The grace of Jesus. Hallelujah. What a grand old song. Nothing like them. Open to Genesis in your Bible, if you would, please. Genesis. <coughs> Excuse me. Genesis chapter 37. Uh, Genesis chapter 37. Page 52 in your Old Testament. Genesis 37, look at verse 1. Genesis 37 and verse 1. Page number 52 in your Old Testament. Genesis 37. And that's in the Pew Bible there, if you have a Pew Bible in front of you. Genesis 37, verse 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. He made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. He could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we, are by, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose, and also stood upright. Behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said, said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? They hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying, and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Now, we've been talking about Joseph for about three, four weeks now. I've lost track. And this is uh, fascinating to look at the life of Joseph because there are so many things we can learn from him. We've learned um, from him. I trust you have, anyway, from these Bible studies. We're going to look at what we would call, I, or at least I call the title of it, Jesus and Joseph. Jesus and Joseph. So um, in the Bible there are types, in the Old Testament especially, you're, it's full of types. And Joseph is a type of the Lord Jesus. In other words, there are things about him that are like Christ or Christ-like or remind us of Christ. And... It's good to look at these things um, because when we see in the Old Testament the types of Christ, we learn a lot of fascinating things. And Joseph is <laughs> probably one of the best types of Christ in the Bible. As you know, Joseph was sold into slavery, and this chapter, if you read on, were to read on, you would see that Joseph is uh, taken by his brothers and uh, actually they intend to murder him and they throw him in a pit and then along come some 
uh, Ishmaelites, and they decide, well, I'll, we'll sell them to him. They'll make profit. I was killing him. doesn't get us nothing. But if we sell him, they'll take him to a far country. We won't have to deal with that, that rascal anymore. That was their way of looking at it, not mine. <laughs> they won't have to deal with this rascal anymore. And uh, we'll make some money off the deal, too. So that's what they did. And as you know, Joseph goes down to Egypt, and he's bought by Potiphar, and he's in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar realizes right away that Joseph is a quality individual. Joseph is one who's living for his God. Joseph is separated. Joseph is, um, uh, is very notable in his life. You know, God, he's faithful to God. He's uh, living the life. He's walking the walk, backs up this talk. And uh, Potiphar notices it and notices the wisdom he has, uh, all coming from God, of course, and puts him in charge of his, his household. Now, we think, well, when we hear this in the Bible, oftentimes, I, I believe we, this, when they say in charge of the household, we think of our own house. Um, there ain't much to be in charge of at my house, you know. I mean, <laughs> there's just four or five of us in the house. Um, but back then, so an important person like Potiphar uh, had an extensive household, and grounds, he had servants, he had, you know, the gardeners, you know, the cooks, the butlers. I mean, he had a, there was a lot going on there. And so when you put somebody in charge of it, it was, it was a major responsibility. And so Joseph's given this major responsibility because he's recognized for the quality individual that he is and that he's uh, walking with God. Well, lo and behold, Potiphar's wife, of course, you know the story, she is... Um, uh, a wicked woman. She is a, a woman who is, desires Joseph, and she tries to get him to commit adultery, and he won't have anything to do with it. And eventually, she entraps him and falsely accuses him, and he's thrown in jail. He's thrown in jail, and uh, uh, Potiphar does this. Potiphar is angry enough to kill him, and who, you know, who can blame him? I mean, if a guy that you put in charge of your household and you thought he had uh, made advances to your wife, um, uh, the average male would want to kill him. <laughs> Not that he would, but he would want to. And uh, so uh, he was very angry. So he has Joseph put in jail. And <clears throat> Joseph, uh, Joseph is in jail, and Joseph is again recognized for his good Christian manhood. And the uh, uh, prison warden puts him in charge of the prison, you know, puts him in charge of the prisoners and things. Even though he's a prisoner himself, he's in charge, and uh, he's living like uh, a Christian should, even though he's been wrongly accused. And we've learned all, all along the way now, we've learned things from these things. And he's living like a, a good Christian from, uh, even though he's in jail. He doesn't get bitter, he's wrongly accused, he's in jail wrongly. Um, he's been slow, sold into slavery by his own brothers. He's had a lot of bad things happen to him. A lot of wrong has come into his life that he doesn't deserve. And so here he is. He's in jail. He meets a butler and a baker. And uh, they have dreams. And he interprets the dreams for them. And, uh, and both the dreams come true. Or, you know, both the dreams come true according to Joseph's interpretation. And um, then when the... Uh, 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 Butler gets out of jail. He doesn't even remember Joseph. He doesn't even remember to put a good word in with him for him. And so the Pharaoh, the king of the land, has a dream. You know the story. He has a dream. He doesn't understand it. So Joseph is remembered all of a sudden. This Butler says, "I remember a guy in prison. He interpreted our dreams, and they all, they were exactly right." And the king says, well, bring him on. I want to hear I want him to translate my dream. So Joseph translates the king's dream for him. And the king realizes, recognizes again, just like Potiphar did, just like the prison warden did, that here's a good Christian young man. They may not have been Christians, but the world uh, usually recognizes uh, good Christianity when they see it and integrity when they see it and good quality in a person when they see it. And that's what you get when you live for the Lord, all those characteristics. And Joseph is doing that. And so here's uh, Joseph. He is um, recognized as one that's, uh, you know, to be in charge of some things. And so the Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of the kingdom, all the treasury of the kingdom, all the resources of the kingdom. He's only second to Pharaoh. Now think of this, from slavery 
to, I guess, equivalent to vice president, you know, equivalent to vice president of the land. So you think about that. That's where he's, he's, he comes to. And so he's, he's vice president. He's the second in command only Pharaoh. Pharaoh doesn't even have to worry about anything. J Joseph takes care of it all. Joseph, of course, gathers food and, and, uh, and uh, prepares for the famine that's to come. And uh, lo and behold, the famine comes, and the only place there's food is Egypt. And the famine was not just confined to Egypt. As you know, it was in Israel. It was everywhere in the area. People were coming to buy food from Egypt and from Joseph, the one being in charge. He's negotiating all the deals. And lo and behold, uh, as you know, Israel sends his sons, some of his sons, down to Egypt to buy corn, as the Bible says. So they go down to buy corn, and there's Joseph. Uh, Joseph is, <laughs> is in charge, and they don't recognize him, you know. He's probably dressed like an Egyptian, you know, one of them things on his head, you know. I don't know what they call them, you know, weird-looking things they put on their head, and, you know, he's... He's got a, a quite the tan by now. He's been out in the sun so much in the southern country there. And he's not recognizable as Joseph. They don't recognize him. He recognizes them, though. You know the story. And he sells them corn. He plays a little trick on them. He has the money put back in the sacks. And, uh, um, and uh, of course, and his, his, uh, his uh, silver cup put in one of them, in the youngest there. And uh, uh, then he accuses them of stealing. And... And it tricks them and keeps the one boy hostage while they go back to tell their dad. And lo and behold, they run out of food. And Jacob says, we need food. And he says, we can't go back without bringing Benjamin with us. And uh, Benjamin, he don't want to go to Egypt, right? And uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, just kidding. But Jacob doesn't want, or, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jacob doesn't want Benjamin to go to Egypt. But finally he relents and lets him go because the hunger takes over. And they go back. And Joseph feeds them again and takes care of them. And then he reveals himself to them. And you saw last week, we talked about how he dealt with his family, the compassion that was there, and the forgiveness. And uh, Joseph was uh, very forgiving and loving for his family. He had such a good attitude about the slavery thing that he said, don't worry, God knew, knew what he was doing when he allowed you to sell me into slavery. He knew that I was going to be there for a reason. And it goes all back to this dream. And especially the second dream, where he dreamed that the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to him. That is exactly what ends up happening, isn't it? He becomes their authority. He's second in Egypt. He brings them all down to the land. Now, Joseph does not flaunt that authority. He does not... Um, does not take advantage of that authority by um, getting revenge on his brothers, and uh, he doesn't do anything like that. He's got a whole good Christian attitude about it. In other words, he's the perfect example of loving your enemies. And his brothers were definitely his enemies, weren't they? They sold him into slavery. That's a pretty strong enemy. And uh, so he's a perfect example of loving your enemies. And he, lo and behold, is in charge, just like the dream that God had given him. God was showing him that someday he would be exalted and Joseph was very humble about it and very godly about it. Now, we'll have a word of prayer and we're going to see what we can learn as Joseph is the type of Christ or Jesus in Joseph. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, the Bible is an amazing book. I'm so thankful that when I open it, I know I have the preserved, inspired words of God. That's only by your grace I know that. It's nothing to be haughty or proud about, and I, I pray often that, and thank you that by your grace I know this because it could be some other way. And I thank you for preserving your words and the opportunity to teach and preach your words. Please help tonight. I pray, Father, that you bless you to your people. I thank you for them. I think of Brother Daniel is uh, maybe ill tonight. We're not sure. I pray for him. I pray for your grace and strength in this our time right now. Please, I yield myself to your Holy Spirit again and ask you to work through me. And I want your people to receive what you have for them. Thank you for the King James Bible, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, Joseph 
is a type of Christ in the, in the Old Testament. And every case is not exact similarities, so don't go technical on me. Um, but there are enough similarities that are types. And there's enough, really, in there that Joseph's life was placed in the Old Testament. Uh, it indicated it, that it's indicated that it's a prophetic to the life of Christ. Um, first of all, look at Genesis chapter 37, verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. So, where, what's the similarity here between him and Christ? Somebody help me tonight. Put your thinking caps on. Yes. They're both shepherds. Um, Joseph was a shepherd. Jesus was a shepherd. Jesus is called the Good Shepherd. And um, he is... In, look at John chapter 10, if you would. John chapter 10. Give me a place there in... Genesis, but look over at John and chapter number 10. I'm slow going here tonight for some reason. There we go, John chapter 10 and verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So he's the shepherd, the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus. So we are the what? The dumb old sheep, right? <laughs> the dumb old sheep. I, God, God has a way of keeping us humble, doesn't he? You think about it. The, if you've ever been around farm animals, you know one of the dumbest animals on the farm is a sheep. <laughs> they are dumb. And God did that for a reason. God wants to keep us humble. In other words, he wants us to know we need him. Amen? <laughs> we need him. Um... We, we get in trouble when we start trying to do things on our own. So we got to remember, we need him. We need the good shepherd. And uh, Joseph was a shepherd, and Jesus is our good shepherd. And we're the sheep. Uh, Joseph was beloved by his father. Look at verse 3 of Genesis 37. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. So he was loved by his heavenly father. He was, uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, look at verse 4 now. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. So, keep in mind here, um, Israel is the beginning of the Jewish nation. Okay, Jacob. Right? You got 11 sons, you're gonna, or I'm sorry, 12 sons, you're going to have 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so, these are the first Jews. Well, Jesus was a Jew, and Jesus was loved by his heavenly Father, but he was hated by his brothers, the Jew, right? He was hated by them, just like Joseph was hated by his brethren. John 1.11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Jesus came to the Jewish people. And when you read the book of Acts uh, carefully, you, you, you'll realize something. There were quite a few Jews at the beginning that did get saved, but as the church of Jerusalem grew in attendance, there were less and less Jewish people getting saved. Remember what Paul ends up doing? He eventually forsakes going to the Jewish people, doesn't he? He goes to the Gentiles, right? Um, Peter was told by God he should go to the Gentiles. He goes to the centurion, remember? and wins him and his family to the Lord. That was, the, that was God telling us, telling the, the first church, I didn't just send Jesus to die for Jewish people. I sent him to die for everyone. And that includes Gentiles. And so um, Jesus was rejected by the Jewish people. And sadly enough to this day, the majority of Jewish people will not accept the Messiah. They do not accept him. It's very sad to say. Now there are some that get saved. Some of them, they recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, but there's very few. So just like the Bible says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Look at verse 13. We didn't read it. I didn't read it to you, but I want you to look at it with me. Verse, 30, verse 13 of chapter 37. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock and sheep him? Come, and I will send thee unto them. 
And so he says, I'm going to send you to them. So we'll, we notice in the story, he goes to see them, and um, uh, he gets there, and they're not there. Look what it says in verse 13, or verse 16. And he said, I seek my brethren. I seek my brethren. So he goes looking for his brethren because they're not where they were, his father told him they were. So he goes to look for them. In other words, he came to seek his brethren. What does it say in Luke 19.10? Somebody that has that memorized, what's it say? Okay, I'll give you a hint. He came to what? Seek and to save that which was lost. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So we see another similarity between Joseph and Christ. Um, Joseph's brethren conspired to kill him in verse 18. Look what it says. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. And in Matthew, you know, look over at Matthew chapter 12, if you would. Matthew chapter 12. And you know the story. You know who called upon uh, uh, the Roman authorities to kill Jesus. It was the Jews. And so you're going over to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 14. It says, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. How they might destroy him. So just like Joseph's brothers decided to kill him, here is the council. These are the Pharisees. These are Jews, in other words. These are his brethren in the flesh. And so they conspire also how they can kill him. Um, look at verse 23. Now I've talked about this coat. Chapter, 20, chapter 37 of Genesis, verse 23. Uh, I want you to keep your place there, remember, by the way. And uh, look at uh, verse number 23. It came to pass when... Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. So he was, his coat of many colors was removed from him. In other words, you remember, what does a coat of many colors represent in the Bible, in the Old Testament? What did it represent? Anybody remember? What? Still in here. Purity. Or um, it represented virtue. Not just purity, but all virtue. It represented virtue. Purity and virtue. So um, that coat of many colors represented that. Jesus um, left his glories of heaven behind, you see. He was worshipped in heaven. Before he came to Bethlehem and took on the form of, of flesh... He was worshipped. He was magnified. He was glorified in heaven. He laid all that aside. And that's what Joseph does here. They, they, uh, this is how we see the type of Christ in him. Um, Joseph was cast into the pit in verse 24. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness. So he's cast into a pit. After Jesus was hung on a cross... And he gave up his life. They put him in a sepulcher, didn't they? They put him in a sepulcher, a type of the pit. All right? And in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 28, you look what it says. Then, they, then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. All right? You remember, Jesus was in the grave 30 days and 30 nights. And he was lifted out of the grave. Did I say 30? I meant three. Three days and three nights. He, he was in the grave, and they lifted him out of the grave. So another, in, another thing that, there, that, that, that we have a similarity to is, is Joseph was sold for some money or betrayed for some money. Jesus was betrayed for some money. 20 pieces for Joseph and 30 pieces for Jesus. And so... Um, we see Reuben in verse 29. Look what it says. Reuben in verse 29. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes. Now, notice that. When they came to the sepulcher where Jesus had been laid, it was empty, wasn't it? The tomb was empty. 
There's another similarity. This is all reminding us of Jesus. This is all foretelling of Christ coming someday. And, you know, uh, got my notes kind of cockeyed here. Let me get this straightened out. There we go. I don't numbered wrong. Joseph was tempted. Look at verse uh, uh, 7 of chapter 39. Genesis 39. Look down at verse number 7. It came past after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. So Joseph was tempted to sin. Remember, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Remember that? Um, three things uh, the, the devil wanted to tempt him with. And Joseph also was tempted, reminding us of what Christ went through. Um, in Genesis chapter 39, verse 20, um, we see that he's put in prison. Joseph, that is, he's put in prison. Well, Jesus Christ, when he gave up life, he went to the spirits in prison, remember, and released them. Uh, Joseph won favor of the keeper in prison. Um, you see that in verse 21 of chapter 39. See what it says there? But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Well, while Jesus was suffering, he won one of the thieves to him. Remember that? Um, Joseph was exalted in chapter 41 in verse 39. Look what it says there. Joseph was... was uh, lifted up. In Pharaoh, I think I sent you the wrong verse. I'm sorry. Let me try that again. 41 verse 39. No, I got it right. Okay, there it is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house according unto thy word. Shall all my people be ruled? Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. This is where I was talking about. He's come second to Pharaoh in the kingdom. And so he's been exalted. And he's placed at the right hand of the king. In verse 42 it says, And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a chain, uh, uh, I'm sorry, put a gold chain about his neck and made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bowed the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. So Joseph is is now the king's right hand man. Well, that reminds you about Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus is at the right hand of his heavenly Father right now. That's where he's seated. Um, we see that uh, Joseph came from a place of death, and now he's at the right hand of the king. Jesus went from a place of death to seated, being seated at the right hand of his heavenly Father. In Genesis chapter 41 and verse 46, it says, And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That number sound familiar to you? 30 years old. Who, how old was Jesus when he started his earthly ministry? 30, right? There's another similarity, another foretelling of Christ through the life of Joseph, a type of Joseph. So we see this all... So far, as we look at this life of Joseph, we've seen how it makes us look to Christ. That's what the Old Testament's all about, you see. It's not just there because it's historical. It's not just there because it's interesting. Those are all true. But it's there to make us look to Christ, you see. To point us to our Savior. And Joseph does that very well. The life of Joseph does that very well, I should say. Um, Joseph provides for his people while he's at the right hand of the king. He's in authority. Um, notice uh, Jesus provides for his people now, doesn't he? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's providing for us. We have all we need in Christ. And Joseph's family had all they need in Joseph, you see. Joseph reveals himself to his brethren in chapter 45, of Genesis and verse number 1, if you'll turn over there. It says there, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried 
cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Um, he knew them, but they didn't know he, who he was until he revealed himself on that happy day. Guess what? Though he can see us now, we cannot see him. But Jesus is coming again soon, amen? And we'll see him. We'll see him. Here's some practical comparisons to help you. I've got a hasten. I have three more pages to go through here. No, yeah, two and a half. Some practical comparisons to help us uh, uh, with, our, with our life. And some of these are review. If you've been here for the whole series on Thursday night, some of these are review, so bear with me. The repetition is the key to learning. First of all, we see Joseph forgave his enemies. His brothers hated him. They conspired against him. They wanted to kill him, and they ended up selling him into slavery. But Joseph loved them and forgave them. Remember last week, we looked at his love for his family. Uh, Joseph loved them, and we're supposed to have the same attitude toward our enemies, aren't we? In Matthew chapter 5, if you'll look over there, Matthew chapter 5, Look at verse 43. Matthew 5 and verse 43. We're supposed to love our enemies. Now this is, is uh, easy for me to say. Uh, and I won't give you that story again. I told it Sunday night again about my first enemy and the victory that God gave me. Not over my enemy, but over myself. And it's a wonderful victory to gain. And it's not easy, I know to love your enemies, especially if they've done some horrendous deed. But at Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, look what it says. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So our enemies are supposed to be loved by us. Right? We are also supposed to pray for them, it says there. It also says we're supposed to do good to them. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, it says, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So we're supposed to turn the other cheek. We are also to, do, to get right with them. In Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 23, it says, Therefore, if thou bring thy, if thou bring thy all, let me try that again. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So we're supposed to take the initiative to try to get right with them. That doesn't mean they're going to get right with us, but we're supposed to have our heart right. We're supposed to make sure our heart's right. Um, you can't control what the other person does, but there's one person you can control. That's me. Or not me, but I mean, <laughs> point at yourself. <laughs> you get what I mean. Um, there's one person you can control, and that's yourself. That's yourself. So um, we're supposed to get right with them. So first practical example is Joseph withstood, or I'm sorry, withstood. Joseph forgave his enemies. Joseph withstood temptation. Jesus Christ taught us how to withstand temptation. Um, my message on Sunday night, I believe, was about that, or was it Sunday morning? I don't remember which right now. But we need to realize that when we are trying to withstand t temptation, we're supposed to claim the presence of God. We're supposed to rely on His Holy Spirit to give us the power to do it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you would. You know this very familiar verse, verse 13. 1 No matter who you are, you will be tempted. Rich, poor, young, old, handsome, ugly, um, whatever it is, you, you know, you will be tempted. You will be tempted. Verse 13, very familiar. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man... But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. God promises there is no temptation that comes to you that you can't handle in his strength. 
and in his power. God says, I'll make a way, and it's not, not more than you can handle. And it says the temptations are common to man. You may think that you're the first person to ever be tempted with it, but you're not. Someone has been tempted before with the same thing. Someone has been tempted before with the same thing. Um, I could stand before God and say, argue with God and say, God, no one has ever loved chocolate as much as Pastor Miller does. I'm addicted to chocolate. I ate half a bag of unsweetened chocolate chips last night. Confessing my faults to you. Um, that's, an, that's too much chocolate. Six ounces of, of unsweetened chocolate chips. Um, you know, other people have been tempted um, we, we, with the same temptation. We have to realize that. There's, there's uh, uh, you know, no matter who you are, we're all flesh and we all face temptation. But God has strength available for us. He has strength available to resist the temptation. Um, then, uh, how do you how do you uh, how do you overcome temptation? Well, first of all, claim the presence of God. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. Look over at Revelation twelve, if you would. Revelation chapter twelve, and look at verse eleven. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You see that? By the word of their testimony. How did they overcome? How did they, you know, get victory? They gave their testimony. I'm telling you, soul winning Christians are victory winning Christians. Christians who always witness and talk about the Lord will not be tempted or will not fall for temptation as those that do not. That's why um, I didn't grasp this at first, but when, I, when, when my pastor had started teaching us about who you would allow to be deacons, who you would allow to be assistant pastors, or, or higher actually be assistant pastors, who would you allow to be deacons, who would you allow to be Sunday school teachers, who would you uh, choose to be in the choir? They, first and foremost qualification, they have to be soul winners. And I didn't understand that being a new Christian, but now as the time has gone by, I realize what it is. The people that overcome temptation the most are those that are soul winners. If you, if you start meddling around and putting people in places of authority in your church, they're gonna, if they're not soul winners, they're going to have a terrible battle on their hands. They're going to be given into the temptations they shouldn't be. And so, um, you know, those that are witnessing and talking about the Lord regularly are going to overcome temptation. It's kind of hard when you're witnessing to somebody to light up of, of some weed, marijuana, and smoke it while you're telling somebody about Jesus. <laughs> it's kind of hard to fall for that temptation, don't you agree? And you can put whatever temptation you want in there. It's kind of hard to, um, you know, be witnessing to somebody and uh, open a can of Budweiser, you know. You know, you're just not going to fall for the temptation if you're telling somebody about Jesus. And so, um, give your testimony. If you're having trouble with t temptation... Go soul winning. Go tell somebody about Jesus. It'll get your mind off the temptation, first of all. And second of all, the Bible says that's how they overcame. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. A very familiar verse. We looked at this uh, this past Sunday. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. And it's how Jesus overcame temptation. He sets, of course, the supreme example of overcoming temptation. And, <clears throat> but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Um, verse 7, look what it says. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. We look at verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What is Jesus quoting here? He's quoting Old Testament verses. So what did Jesus do to overcome temptation? 
He used the Word of God. He used the Word of God. Um, I can never stress enough the importance of the Word of God to the Christian. We are to use the Word of God when it comes to temptation. Somebody offers you a drink, think of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a monk, or strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Think of that verse if somebody offers you a drink. And say, say to yourself, do I want to be wise or do I want to be a fool? Because <laughs> the opposite of wise is foolishness, right? <laughs> so when somebody offers you a drink, think of that verse. Wine is a monk or strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That means you're f foolish if you take that drink. So um, think of those verses. Uh, use the word of God. Use the word of God. Um, look at Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, if you would. Uh, I remember teaching my oldest boy. My wife actually taught him this. I believe it was her. Taught him um, Psalm chapter 1. That was the first chapter in the Bible he ever memorized. Um, she taught him this. Verse 1, oh, look what it says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. So we see in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that if we will get proper counsel or proper advice from the right people, in other words, usually... Excuse me. There, I got rid of it. Usually, it is, um, that would be older, wiser people. And we're not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Put aside all the bad things they're teaching in public school. And boy, are they teaching some bad things here now. Oh my goodness. You should have heard about this one um, state. I forget which one. I heard a news report the other day about... The, they sent this teachers, they recommended these teachers all go to this conference. You heard about it? This conference, and all it was was on all sorts of perverted sexual behavior. And they told the teachers to go to this thing so they could inform their students. They're teaching some wicked stuff in these schools nowadays. These public schools are filthy, vile cesspools. If you don't like that, go there and see what they're teaching. And, but set all that aside. Let's say they didn't teach any of that bad stuff. I couldn't send my children to public school anyway because the Bible says, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. You're not supposed to subject your children to the counsel of the ungodly. The, the school is full of ungodly people. The majority of them are unsaved. Now, I know there are some good Christians there, some nice Christians, let me put it that way there. Um, i correct myself. But the, the, for the most part, they're ungodly. So even if they weren't teaching, if they were just teaching math, history, and science right down the line, I still couldn't send them there. They're the ungodly. We're not supposed to be under the counsel or the instruction of the ungodly. We're supposed to go to those that are spiritual for advice. Spiritual advice. So look at verse 2 now. It says, or I'm sorry, verse 1 again. It says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. That means we're not to stand around or hang around with the wrong crowd. You know, when you run with the right crowd, you're going to get strength to resist temptation. You run with the wrong crowd, they're going to ask you to go to Tioga Downs, or they're going to ask you to go have a, a drink, or now they're going to ask you to go to one of the weed shops down here. <laughs> the wrong crowd, that's what they do. And so you've got to hang around the right crowd. Now, you know, that, that, that's something that, people struggle with all the time. I see it. I counsel it. And a lot of people fall into temptations. About 90% of the problems that Christians have come from because they were with the wrong crowd. And take it from somebody who's counseled people and lots of people. 
So you have to hang around the right crowd. Verse 2, it says, delight, um, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. What's the law of the Lord? This book. This book. This is where a person gets happiness from. This is what he's happy to read. The word of God is not drudgery. This is, you, you realize how exciting this book is? I mean, truth it comes up and, and slaps you right in the face all the time when you're reading it. I mean, <laughs> sometimes I'll be reading along. I was reading this morning, and I was reading along, and I, um, and I went right over the thing, and I kept I kept right on reading, you know, because I'm trying to get a certain distance in the Bible as I'm reading, and this because I have a schedule I stay on, and uh, then all of a sudden I realized a chapter later I said, man, let me go back and read that again. I went back to the, a chapter back. Because the Lord was giving me something, was telling me something. And so I ended up writing four different things down that I needed to have written down for me and my family um, right there in that one spot. This book is an amazing book. It's an amazing book. You've got to get into it and delight yourself. Learn to love the Word of God. Learn to delight in reading it. Um, there was a time I hated reading English books. But now I find them fascinating. That's on purpose. I hate English grammar. <laughs> Anybody else relate to that? <laughs> you know, but you can learn to love something. Learn to love the Bible. Learn to read it. Look at verse 2. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Um, that's like a cow chewing on its cud, meditating. You've seen a cow. They'll just sit there and their mouth's moving. They don't bend their head down for quite a while because they've got something in there they've been chewing on. They've been, uh, that's what the Bible says means by meditate. We're supposed to think about the Word of God. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to think about what that truth means and how to apply it to our life. That's what we're supposed to do. So th those are some th those are some ways to re to avoid temptation, right there. Now, here's a, I'll give you five ways in general how we're supposed to be like Christ, and then we'll go home. In Matthew chapter three, look there, would you please? We're not going back to Genesis tonight, I don't believe. So just don't worry about keeping that place. Just go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. And look at verse 15. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So picture it. John the Baptist is standing there, and Jesus says, Baptize me. And John says, No way, Jose. That's, that's what's in the Greek, okay? No, just kidding. He says, no, he forbade it, it says. John doesn't want to baptize Jesus. Jesus, he, he, John knows that Jesus is somebody special. Here is the Son of God. How, why should I baptize him? He says, I want you to baptize me, Jesus. But Jesus says, no, we have to fulfill all righteousness. You need to baptize me. So, Jesus and John go down in the Jordan River and John baptizes him. What does that mean? He immerses him. He dunked him. What an honor and a privilege to baptize the Lord Jesus. He baptized the Lord Jesus. He, he immerses him in the water. So one of the ways we can be like Christ, exactly like him, is we can get dunked. Amen? <laughs> we can get baptized by immersion just like Jesus did. 
It's one of the very few things you can do exactly like Jesus. You can get baptized like Jesus was by a Baptist preacher. Um, I'm not going to apologize for it. It was John the Baptist, okay, that baptized him. Okay? Um, they don't like that in the other translations, so they call it John the Baptizer. They don't like the fact he was a Baptist. So, um, John the Baptist, the correct translation, Baptist, baptized Jesus. So you can be baptized by a Baptist preacher just like Jesus. You can do it just like Jesus. Another thing you can do is the same work that Jesus did. Look at John chapter 14. <clears throat> Excuse me. John chapter 14 and look at verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So we're supposed to do the works that Jesus did. Look at verse, 20, uh, verse 21 of chapter 20 now. John chapter 20, verse 21. It says, Then said, said Jesus to them, again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So we're supposed to do the same work that Jesus did. And what work is it that Jesus did? We read it in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, where I reminded you of it. I don't remember if I took you there. Well, why don't we go there? Look at Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. So what is the work that Jesus came to do? Was it to turn water into wine? No. Was it to heal the lame? No. Was it to cause the blind to see? No. Those are good works that he did, and I'm glad he did them. But why did he come here? What is the work that God the Father sent him to do? Verse 10 of chapter 19. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So we're supposed to do his work. This is why you're going to come to this church, you're going to hear soul winning emphasized over and over and over. By the way, that's how we met just about every one of you, through soul winning. You're saved, most all of you, as far as I know, by somebody telling you about Jesus, a soul winner, and you got saved. You think about it, if someone wasn't doing the work of Christ, you might be lost right now. Now, let's apply that to ourselves. There might be people lost because we're not doing the work of Christ. Jesus said we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to do his works. So we can be baptized like Jesus. We can do the same work that Jesus did. Look at Luke chapter 10 now. Luke chapter 10. I'm reminding you of general ways to be like Christ. First of all, we can be baptized. Secondly, we can do the same work that Jesus did. Look at uh, Luke 10 verse 37. And he said, He that showeth mercy on him, on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Go and do thou likewise. Um, he said, this is of course the story of the Good Samaritan and the one that showed the mercy. We're supposed to be like Jesus with, when it comes to mercy or loving people. We're supposed to love like Jesus did. We're supposed to love like Jesus did. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. This, is, this verse is so important to the Christian because it ties your attitude and your thinking and my thinking and my attitude to the very words of God and the importance of having the preserved, inspired words of God. Philippians 2.5. This is vital. You know the verse. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to let the mind of Christ be in us. We're supposed to have the mind just like Christ. Can I ask you something? How can you have the mind of Christ if you don't have the words of Christ? And how can you have the words of Christ if a book comes along and says it's a better translation and they remove 60,000 words out of the New Testament alone? How can you have the words of Christ? Huh? Think about it. That's what the NIV does. 
And that's what other versions do. Perversions is actually what they are. The perverted books. The perverted, and I'll tell you what, they're vile. If that hair lips somebody, so be it. But that's what it is. The mind of Christ is vital to the Christian. And if you don't have the words of Christ, you can't have the minds of Christ, or the mind of Christ. You just can't. You've got to have the words of Christ preserved somewhere perfectly. You've got to. Or you're not going to have the mind of Christ because you're not going to go have a personal conversation with him where he talks to you in an audible voice. You've got to have the words of God. That's why Jesus uh, resists the temptation with the words of God. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. And you notice what he said, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. We have an every word book. Don't ever forget it. We're to love like Jesus. We're to do the work that Jesus did. We're to be baptized like Christ. We're to have his mind. And look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. By the way, you preacher boys, write that down, that, that Philippians 2, 5. There's a sermon there for you. I gave you um, a little bit of an outline of it. But there's a sermon there about having the mind of Christ being able, be, the only way you can do that is if you have the words of God. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, look what it says. And this is the last thing I'll give you tonight. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now what's it talking about? Um, well, what it's talking about is we're supposed to be growing spiritually every day. We're supposed to be striving to be like Christ. Will you be perfect? No. The Bible says that you have the old nature. I have the old nature. Inside of us, there's a battle going on. We've got the Holy Spirit, and we've got the old nature that wants to do sinful things. But we're supposed to try to be perfect. In other words, it's spiritual maturity we're shooting for. The best we can get before we die and go to be with Jesus. Or He comes in the clouds, which I think is soon. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. Praise the Lord for that. But we're to attempt to live the best of our ability like Him. That's what we're to do. And um, we cannot set that aside. So we're to be baptized like Christ. We're to do the same work Christ did. We're to love like Jesus loved. We're to have the mind of Christ. And we're to attempt to live like Him. We're supposed to do our best to live like Christ lived. Let's pray. Father... Thank you for your dear people, a uh, very attentive group, very uh, desirous to hear the Word of God taught and learn and apply it. I pray that you bless them for it. Please, get all the honor and glory for it. Thank you for this time we've had together. And I'll bless the uh, praise and thanksgiving time in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, I'll get this stopped. Stop that stream if you would, please. I'll stop this recorder. And someone get that chair, please, down there.